Greetings, brethren. Today I'd like to uh, talk about the Sabbath. Years ago, Mr. Armstrong stated that, that of all the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath was really a test commandment. And just how is that? Well, for one reason, it could really impact your income, which would affect your family. Now, what I'd like to do is just give you my personal example not because I think I'm something special, but it's just to demonstrate how God works worked in my life, and He can certainly work in those that want to remain faithful and obey. Now, I came to the understanding of the Sabbath, you might say, in stages. Originally, I understood you have to keep the Sabbath, but my understanding was like you kept the Sabbath like people keep Sunday. You, you go to church, you, you, you work, you do your own thing, and, and that sort of thing. And I came to the knowledge and understanding of the Sabbath by reading a booklet that the Worldwide Church of God had called U.S. and B.C. and Prophecy. And the first time I read it, I, was, I found it interesting, but it really had no impact on me. And I was working at a prison at the time, in a hospital, on the second floor, so especially on graveyard shift, I had a lot of time to myself because we did checks about once an hour or so for 52 minutes or so. I was left with myself and I did a lot of reading. I'd read magazines and things like that, but I was reading this booklet. And it wasn't until the second time I read it that God opened my mind to the understanding that the Sabbath had to be kept. You know, so it wasn't just a nice idea, but you had to keep the Sabbath. But like I said, I mean, I didn't understand at that time that you had to not work on the Sabbath. So a little bit later in time, God opened my understanding to the fact that you don't only had to keep the Sabbath, but keeping the Sabbath meant you don't work. You don't do any of your work. You don't earn money on the Sabbath. You, you rest totally. And I vaguely, vaguely, I understand so clearly as I was walking back and forth up in the hospital on the, on the second floor, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I have to not work. And where I was working, we had a shift that was four days on and two days off. So naturally your time off would come closer to the weekend every week. So eventually the Sabbath would be an issue with my job. And I was walking up and walking back and forth upstairs, and it dawned on me, I, the Sabbath was coming up and I was scheduled to work, and I said to myself, I cannot work this coming Sabbath. And you know, less than 30 seconds after that, the supervisor came upstairs, and he says, Renee, he says, one of the guys that was supposed to work this afternoon can't make it. How would you like to work a double shift? And I said to him, Bill, I'll work a double shift if I can have this coming Sabbath off. And he says, you got it. So God intervened there pretty rapidly once I made the decision I wasn't going to work. So later on, I had to quit my job. So I didn't have a job to go to. I just knew I had to quit. And I remember the last day I was working, we were having a sort of a little get-together at work. They were wishing me well, my co-workers. And one of the employees there, which I knew quite well, said to me, he says, uh, are you quitting your job, which was a good government job with reasonable pay and, and really good benefits, because of religious beliefs? And I had to answer, yes, I am. And he said to me, he said, I think you're making a big mistake. Well, here I am, I had to, I come to the realization I had to quit my job, and which I did, I resigned, but I had no job to go to. I didn't know what I was going to do. It was in the summer of 1969, and uh, I just knew that I couldn't keep working at the job I was doing. So that summer, I worked at about three different types of jobs, and none of them conflicted with the Sabbath. They were fine, but I didn't have any steady employment. I mean, it was just part-time here and part-time there. And one day, during August, probably about mid-August, 
I didn't happen to be working at the time. I decided I would go up and help my father, who needed some help, and he lived a few blocks north of where I was living in Coquitlam. So I went up there and uh, give him a hand. And the work I had to do was in the early afternoon, it was about two hours of work. And uh, after I finished working, I, I said goodbye to him and I was standing there and for some reason I had an incredible urge, just an urge internally, to go apply for a job at the gas company. So I followed my instincts. I drove about 45 minutes to Burnaby. It was actually right on the boundary of Vancouver and Burnaby down on the coast of British Columbia. And I, uh, I went in and I said, uh, I'm here to apply for a job at the receptionist. And she says to me, she says, well, that's very interesting because we're planning on hiring some people. So she gave me an application and I sat there for maybe 15, 20 minutes and filled out the application. And then I handed it back in and I was about to leave. And she says, oh, the, the personnel manager will see you right away. And I really found that strange that, you know, you fill out an application, usually you leave it and, you know, it goes into the personnel office the personnel manager's office, and he looks at it and he files it in the garbage. And you know, he never hear from them again, but he, he interviewed me right away. And it was a very interesting interview. I mean, I was talking to him about my past experiences and telling him about working at the, at the prison, and he took a un, well, almost unsurreal or yeah, unrealistic, well, not unrealistic, but a very keen interest in, in my job at the prison. And I talked to him for quite a while, longer than what I had anticipated talking with him. And he said to me, he says, uh, well, thank you very much. He says, I'll be in touch. So I went home and I guess about two weeks later, I told my wife, I says, I, I'm, I'm going to phone and see how, you know, my application is going, you know, because he did say he was going to get in touch with me and I haven't heard from him. So I called him up on a Friday. It was uh, probably September 13th? No, September 12th. It was a Friday. And I called him up and I said, it's, it's Rene Messier. I'm calling about that job application. And he said, he says, oh, he says, Rene, I'm really glad you called me. He says, I've been meaning to call you. And, uh, I, you know, I got busy and I, I didn't get back to you. So he says, oh, incidentally, he says, we want you to start work on Monday, which is September 15th. And he said, we want you to start up out in the Fraser Valley. And I had anticipated having to work in Vancouver, which would have involved a lot of traveling. But no, he says, we want you to start in Fraser Valley. Report there uh, Monday morning. So I got the job with the gas company, you know, on September 15, 1969. And I worked there until summer of 2007 for some 38 years and nine months. And the job I had was a good job. And not only had God blessed me with a, a good paying job, I mean, at the time it was a good paying job, but it was the way he worked with me in the company. I went from the laborer's position in the company in 1969 to the highest paying position in the union in, in less than five years. And I knew, I know God had a hand in this promotion and I knew he was blessing me because of my obedience and furthermore I got my first aid ticket so I was literally the highest paid union employee single highest paid union employee for many years until I transferred to, uh, to Princeton and took a, a bit of a cut in pay but that was you know my choice but that's how God you know worked in my life and, and blessed me so I was really grateful for that and I had a long career with the company We had good benefits and lots of time off. So I'd like to turn now to where did Sunday come from? You know, what about its origins? And Actually, it was in the second century that the Roman Catholic Church changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday. And this is what 
it says in Wikipedia about it. It says, in the second century, the Roman Church lacked jurisdiction, jurisdictional authority, to impose a, a novel universe, universal change of Sabbath rest from the seventh day to the first day, or to obtain universal Sunday worship had it been introduced after the Christian Church that spread throughout the known world. So it says the Catholic Church that actually changed the Sabbath to Sunday, Sunday worship. And in their, in their book, written by a cardinal, about answers to the questions in regards to the Catholic religion, they quote in this book that the Protestant churches actually followed us in this change from the Sabbath to Sunday. And they admit that they didn't have the authority to do it in the sense that it wasn't biblical because it says in the, in the book, if you were following the Bible, you would be keeping the Sabbath. But we, as the church, felt we had the authority to change it to Sunday. And all the other churches basically followed us in that change. So that's where the origin of the Sunday came from in the, in the third century. Now let's look at what God says about the Sabbath. Turn over with me to Genesis, the second chapter, and we'll go to the origin of when the Sabbath actually came into, into being. Over in Genesis 2, I'd like to start there. Genesis 2, and I'll be reading verses 1 to 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work from which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because it, in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So notice, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth, and all the host of heaven were finished. In other words, it was a complete work. There was no need to add anything to it. And not only that, then he blessed it. He put his blessing on it, which is not, which is not on any other day of the week, only on the Sabbath. Only on the Sabbath God blessed and he also sanctified it. In other words, he put it aside for special use and rested. And he didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he sort of stood back and rejoiced at what he had accomplished. And a lot of us, when we accomplish a task, you know, you're so involved sometimes, so close to your work, you don't take the time to sort of stand back and, and admire it. And that's all God was doing. But the key issue is here that he sanctified the day and he blessed it. He didn't bless Thursday, Wednesday, any other day of the week, but he did bless the Sabbath. And also notice in Exodus uh, chapter 16, Exodus 16, and I want to read uh, verses 22 to 26. It says in verse 22, and so it was on the sixth day that God gathered twice as much, that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath, rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil tomorrow and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. And in verse 24, So they laid up till morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today it will not be found in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath day, there will be none. There won't be any manna out there on the seventh day. Notice it's referred to as the Holy Sabbath in verse 23. It's holy because God put his presence in that day, and it's a Sabbath to the Lord. 
it belongs to him, as stated in verse 25. So it doesn't belong to man, it belongs to him, and he gave it to us for our benefit. Now let's notice when it was codified, in other words, written in stone, showing that it's of lasting durability through, throughout time, and written by God, not by man. And that's found over in Exodus 20, a few pages over. And we'll read verses 8 to 11 of Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So what's he saying here? Is he saying, forget about the Sabbath? Don't pay any attention to it? No, he says, remember the Sabbath. God says, remember the Sabbath, and most of mankind forgets the Sabbath. He goes on in verse 9, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. So God is telling us that you have six days prior to the Sabbath to do your work, but don't trample, in a sense, on my Sabbath. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So it's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Here again, as an individual, you don't do any work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor the female servant nor your cattle nor your, or the stranger that is within your gates. So every individual or thing that you have jurisdiction over is not to do any, you're not to do any work. And a modern example would be you don't take your lawnmower out, which would be equivalent like your cattle, and go cut the grass on the Sabbath. Although you may be just sitting there, not doing the work yourself, but you're not to have, you know, the lawnmower cut the grass. It's doing the work for you. And he goes on in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. So he talks about his creation during that week and rested on the seventh day, reiterating once again his, the fact that he rested Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath. He put a blessing on it. He doesn't bless any other day and haloed it. In other words, made it holy time by his presence in it. Also, it's uh, listed in the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, the word, some of the wording is just slightly different. But the fact that it's in there twice in the Bible, the complete Ten Commandments, but you know, including the Sabbath, shows that God is putting emphasis on it, adding it for emphasis because it is really important. So if you'd like to turn to Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, Deuteronomy 5, and uh, we'll be reading verses 12 to 15. Here it says, observe the Sabbath. It doesn't start off by remember it, but he says, observe it. Keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day. To... Well, observe the Sabbath day, which means keeping it. Uh, to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. In other words, it's holy time. You keep it holy. Six days you should do uh, your labor and do all your work. So here again... Uh, admonition that you do your work during the six days and verse 14 but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God so it's his Sabbath in it you shall do no work nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates that your male servant and and your female servant may rest as well as you. So here again, it, reiterating those individuals that you have jurisdiction over are not to do any work. And in, uh, in verse 15 it says, And remember that you were... See, this is a, a little different things that they were to remember as opposed to how it's worded in Exodus. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So he's given them a little history lesson in the sense that you were once enslaved, but I brought you out of slavery. And part of that coming out of slavery, 
given you some freedom was the fact that he instituted and wanted them to keep the Sabbath. Also, a few pages over, or actually back to uh, Exodus 23, I want to read a, another verse in regards to this in, in, in the book of Exodus 23. Exodus 23 and a verse 12. It says, reiterating once again, six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. So notice, God is not just concerned about ref our refreshment <coughs> from lack of work, but he's concerned about the animals. So you're not working the animals for seven days in a row. Even they get a rest, a blessing in the sense from you keeping the Sabbath because you don't work them on the Sabbath. And notice again that it's a time for a refreshment, being refreshed. Please turn to Leviticus 23. And then uh, I'd like to read verse 3. It says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So here again, stressing the fact that it's a solemn day, a holy convocation, and it belongs to, the, it belongs to God, it belongs to the Lord. Let's go over to Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel, uh, 20th chapter and verses uh, 19 and 20. It says, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. Hollow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between you and me that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So here, it further, further emphasizes that the Sabbath is a sign. For what? It's a sign that you may know, we may know that we are worshiping the Lord God, the God of the Bible. And this is further emphasized and expanded in Exodus 31. If you'd like to turn there, Exodus 31, a few pages over. Exodus 31 in verse 13 to 18. Exodus 31 in verse 13 says, should get in the right book. Exodus 31. Verse 13. Speak to the children of Israel, say, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So you notice that it's a sign that we may know that we are worshiping the one and true God, and not only that, that, he's, that we are sanctified by him, set aside for special use. And in verse 14, it says, You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy to you, so it's holy time. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall surely be cut off from his people. So God took very seriously the keeping of the Sabbath. I mean, the penalty is death. And it goes on in verse uh, 15. He says, Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death, emphasizing once again the severe penalty for breaking the Sabbath. Verse 16, Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. 
Now, that's interesting, isn't it? It's not temporary, but a perpetual covenant. A sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Marking permanency. Forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of testament, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So, what do we have here? We have God's Sabbath. It's not anyone else's. It's a sign throughout your generation. A sign that we may know it is God who sanctifies us, those of us that keep it, it sets us apart for special use. It is set, set apart for special use. And it's a sign between us and God that we are worshiping the one and true God. No other day carries that sign, only the Sabbath. And the penalty was quite severe at that time for those who broke the Sabbath. But it is a sign for all times. And it shows the permanency of it because it's, they were written on, the Ten Commandments were written on stone and so was the Sabbath by the very finger of God. It wasn't carved in there by Moses or any other human being. It was God who actually wrote it in stone to show it, its permanency and the fact that it just, you can't just burn them up like a piece of paper. They were there for a long time. I'd like to go over to Ezekiel 20th, right? Ezekiel chapter 20th right now. There's further scriptures and the importance of the Sabbath. Uh, Ezekiel 20 and verse 19. It says, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and my judgments and do them. Hollow the Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So here again, emphasizing that the Sabbath is a sign that we may know that the God of the Bible, the God of creation, is our God. And of course the penalty is quite severe if you uh, break the Sabbath. Over in Revelation 13, I want to cover something here in Revelation 13 because it is important because how things are going to be not too far down the road in the in the near future. In Revelation 13 it says that in verse uh, 16 to 17 verse 16 Revelation 13 it says uh, Breaking into the thought here, he causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand and on their foreheads, and that no man may buy or sell except he who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we know that the mark of the beast is going to be in the future uh, imposed Sunday worship. And it's going to be difficult for you, if you're not keeping Sunday, to buy goods. So here again, you know, it's a test because what are you going to do? Now, don't think that Sabbath keepers will not be marked or identified as those who do not worship on Sunday or the other pagan festivals. I know I was having a conversation with my neighbor and it wasn't that pleasant because we were having a bit of a, a discourse. Uh, and she said to me, she says, oh, you're just, you know, you're, you're just a Jehovah Witness. And we said, well, we're we're not Jehovah Witnesses. And then later on I was thinking, well, how is it that she thought that I was a Jehovah Witness? Well, for one thing, Jehovah Witnesses do not keep Christmas. And when you drive down my street at Christmas time, no lights. So it's pretty obvious that we don't keep Christmas. No Christmas tree around or any, any decorations. So 
That's pretty obvious. And don't you think, too, with the technology we have today, I mean, they could enter your name in a computer, and especially if we go, you know, to a more of a cashless society, and you go to the grocery store and try to pay with your your credit card, and they've, they've already marked you as a Sabbath keeper, and they don't sell you anything, you know, you're really going to have to trust God, and it, that's going to be a test for you, a real test, you know, are you going to break the Sabbath, or are you going to keep the Sabbath and allow God to provide for you? So there'll be a time when God's two servants will be protected. We know that too. But unfortunately, some will not be protected. And it may be connected to the fact that of this buying and selling in, in the future and uh, being marked and identified as a, as a Sabbath keeper and, and then remaining faithful and loyal under those circumstances, which we know are going to be quite severe on mankind. Now I'd like to cover a few scriptures about the fact that we know that the Sabbath was given to Israel and to true Christians today, the spiritual body of Jesus Christ, we're Sabbath keepers. But And they kept the Sabbath, and unfortunately they did, there was... They broke the Sabbath, and that was part of the reason why they, well, the two main reasons was Sabbath breaking and idolatry was why they went into captivity. They didn't have the heart to do it in a proper way, even in a physical sense. So that was one of the major reasons they went into captivity. So we know that it was given to them, and they they kept it, you know, some of them faithfully for many years, but after a while they slid into idolatry and other things of, of breaking the Sabbath and caused their, their downfall as a nation. But you're moving forward into the time of Christ. I mean, people say, I'm a Christian, I follow Christ. And yet, why don't they follow him in the area of a Sabbath keeping? And I'd like to just cover a few scriptures showing from the Bible that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, kept the Sabbath. So the first scripture I'd like to turn to is in the the book of Mark, Mark uh, 1 and verse 21, it says, Then they went in, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and, and thought, taught. So Christ kept the Sabbath, and he taught in the synagogues on the Sabbath, setting us an example of keeping the Sabbath. Also in, in Mark, a few pages over, in Mark 6, in Mark 6 and verse 2 it says, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogues, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is it which he is given to him with, that such mighty works are performed by his hand? So, of course, they didn't realize, a lot of them didn't realize he was actually the son of God, and that's where he got the power from. And he, uh, he never claimed that the power came from him. He always gave credit to God, miracle powers and things of that nature. He acknowledged that God was given him the power and to give glory to God the Father. He wasn't looking for self-glorification. Also in Luke 6, Begin, we'll read verses 2 to 5 of, of Luke 6. It says, And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? That was their interpretation. But Jesus answered them and said, Have you not read this, what David did when he was uh, hungry, and those who were with him? In verse 4, And how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, 
which is not lawful for any to do but the priest, but any but the priest to eat. And then he carried on and said, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So what is he telling us here? He said he is the Lord of the Sabbath, but they didn't have a, a complete understanding of what he was saying here because he was the one who actually gave them the Sabbath to their ancestors in Exodus, and he was the one that wrote with his finger on the, on the, uh, on the stones, the tablets of stones. And furthermore, brethren, he is the one who knows what is acceptable as far as things to do on the Sabbath. And they were condemning him unjustly, and he just wanted to let them know that he, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, he instituted it. He certainly qualified to let us know what's acceptable as far as behavior and things of that nature that we can do on the Sabbath, since it came from him originally. And turn over a few pages over in Luke 13. Luke 13 and uh, verse 10, it says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So, what do we see here? He was teaching. And also, what he, what he did, in verse 11, it says, And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bent over, and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed of your infirmity. So he's showing here that it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. He was healing on the Sabbath, doing a good deed. And of course, the Pharisees, the critical and having all these rules and regulations, which God never kept himself, they were implemented by man. He just overruled them in the sense because he did what he knew was, was acceptable. They rejected what he was doing, but he was laying an example for us, saying that it's certainly okay to do good, good things on the Sabbath. Also in uh, the book of John, we're looking at uh, the fact that Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. Over in the book of John, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Okay, First John 5, uh, verse 8. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Here again, a healing on the Sabbath. And immediately the man uh, was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was a Sabbath day. So here's another example of Christ showing us that it's certainly good and fine to do good on the Sabbath. Also, Christ's apostles and the followers kept the Sabbath. Please turn over to uh, Luke, the 23rd chapter. Luke 23 and verse 56. It says, And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrance, also, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So here, an example of that, they made preparations and rested according to the, the commandment in regards to rest on the Sabbath. Now let's have a look at what it says in the New Testament about the Sabbath in uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 4. Hebrews 4 and verse 4, it says, um, And he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Quoting from Genesis 2, 2, uh, Genesis 2 and verse 2, 
and, and uh, going down to verse 9, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version, it says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Now, when you read that, it, it, it's not uh, the best translation to convey what was written here in the book of Hebrews. And uh, the American Standard Bible uh, puts it this way. It says, There remaineth therefore a Sabbath, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And you notice... It's the people of God that there remains a Sabbath rest for, not just those who are God's people. And the ISV says, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Same thing. And of course, we know the King James Version says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And the same thing with the New King James. It says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And the Revised Version says, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So that's a more accurate uh, description of what was intended here. And also the, the YLT version says, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And you know, the original Greek word used in this for the, for the word rest is sabbatismos. That's the Greek word, which means the Sabbath. So the correct translation is, therefore, there remains, which means, like that saying, remember, there remains, it's still there. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So if you're a, a true follower of Jesus Christ and you claim to be one of God's servants, then there remains a Sabbath rest for you. It's clear that the Sabbath has not been done away with. Let's look at what we can expect in the millennium. In regards to the Sabbath, turn over with me now to the book of uh, Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 46, in verse 3, it says, Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the entrance to the gateway before the Lord on what? On the Sabbaths and the new moons. And you notice the, it says Sabbaths plural because although the sermon is about the Sabbath, the holidays are also annual Sabbaths. And that's another topic, but that's why it, it says Sabbaths plural in this particular verse. So we're not only supposed to keep the weekly Sabbath, but we're as God's people, we're supposed to also keep the annual Sabbaths. Also in Isaiah 66, in Isaiah 66, I'd like to read verse 23. Isaiah 66, 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. So we're looking at a time in the millennium, and what does it tell us? All flesh will come and worship eventually. All will be keeping the Sabbath. They're not going to be coming to Jerusalem to keep Sunday, or Friday, or Tuesday or Wednesday, they're coming there to keep the Sabbath because eventually everyone on the earth will keep the Sabbath day and keep it holy according to the intent of God even from the beginning of instituting it from creation. And also in Revelation 22, Revelation 22, and uh, I'd like to read verses 12 and 24. 12, I'm sorry, 12 to 14. It says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his works. I am Alpha 
and omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Hmm. And verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So notice here, he's saying, a blessing is on those who keep the commandments. And of course, one of the commandments is the keeping of God's holy Sabbath. So what have we learned here today? Well, we've learned that the Sabbath was part of creation. It was instituted by God on the very first week of creation, the creation week. And it was made permanent by God when he gave the tablets to the children of Israel, written on stone, showing its permanency, and they were intended to last. The Sabbath is holy time. It's not our time. God made it holy. He sanctified it by putting his presence in it. And it's also a sign, which is very important that we remember this, because it's a sign between us and God, the Creator, that we are worshiping the true God, not false gods, but the God of creation, the God of the Bible. And that's the only sign that God give us that we were worshiping the true God and he gives it to his people. No other day carries that sign. It was kept by the nation of Israel and as long as they were faithful in keeping it, they were blessed. But when they turned away from the Sabbath and other sins, what happened to them? They went into captivity. It will also be kept, it was kept by Jesus Christ and the apostles. You can read it in the New Testament, the first four books of the Bible, um, of the New Testament, that is, the Gospels. And there's many examples there of the apostles, of Jesus Christ keeping the Sabbath, gives the example of what you can do. He's uh, Lord of the Sabbath, instituted it, brought it into being, certainly capable as the God of creation to give us an example of what we can do and what we can't do on the Sabbath, what's acceptable to God to do on the Sabbath. He made it holy by putting his presence in it. The Apostle Paul and the Gentiles and the Greeks in, New, in the book of Acts, you can read in many places there, where they kept the Sabbath. They didn't do away with it. They kept it faithfully. And in the millennium, it's going to be kept not just by the Israelites. Eventually, it will be kept by everyone. Everyone on the face of the earth will eventually keep the Sabbath, the only sign that God gave to his people. And not only that, they will be keeping the annual Sabbaths at the time. So it's really incumbent upon us today to remain faithful to God and by showing that faithfulness to God and to keeping his commandments, that we, as, as the church of God, as God's people, that we keep the Sabbath faithfully today, which looks forward to the time when everyone will be keeping it in the future.